Good afternoon and welcome to Integrating Disparate Data Sources for an Actionable and Holistic Patient Picture, a Health System CIO Media Inc. production sponsored by Healthcare Triangle. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Health System CIO, and I will be your moderator today. We're looking forward to your participation. You can send your questions or comments in at any time in the Q&A box. We'll take those later in the program. And we may, if we have time, do a one question audience poll. Nice way to view the screen, click on the top center, get it in side-by-side -side mode. Then you can adjust the divider to get the video boxes and the slides the size you want them. And it should say speaker view in the top right-hand corner. Just so you see how we're gonna spend our time today, we're gonna go about 40, 40 minutes first with our main panel discussion featuring Dr. Stephanie Lahr, CIO and CMIO at Monument Health, Becky Fox, CNIO at Atrium Health, Joe Grinstead, VP with Healthcare Triangle, and Ashley Rogers, also a VP with Healthcare Triangle, and then we'll have our Q&A. Well, we're looking forward to uh, a nice in-depth discussion today, so we're going to jump right in. Um, Stephanie, let's start with you. Can you give us an overview of your organization and your role? Sure. Thanks. Happy to be here. So. Um... I am, as you mentioned, at Monument Health. We are a not-for-profit healthcare system based in Rapid City, South Dakota. Um, we serve basically all of Western South Dakota, some of Eastern Wyoming and Northern Nebraska. Um, we are a tertiary care provider. We do most things other than transplants and you definitely have to travel several hundred miles in any given direction to, um, to find much of anything else other than us. Uh, I am the CIO and CMIO have been in that combination of roles for um, uh, two and a half years or so, and um, excited to have this conversation today. I am an internal medicine physician by background, but obviously, given my two fun and exciting titles, spend um, nearly all of my time in the informatics and IT side now. Excellent. Thank you, Stephanie. Becky? So I'm Becky Fox. I am a nurse by background and serve as the chief nursing informatics officer at Atrium Health. I'm also the founder of a company called Vital Circle, which helps uh, deliver symptom tracking and contact tracing um, to uh, businesses, uh, enterprises, and uh, service solutions, as well as venues that want to help protect folks during the COVID pandemic. Um, so, uh, as, as Stephanie has mentioned, you know, we spent a lot of time in informatics and trying to figure out how to solve the, uh, the problems of the world, how to set strategy and vision and, and, and get the right technology in the right hands at the right time in the right place. And really glad to be here with you today to talk about some of the challenges that exist in the world and how we can all contribute to that to make it better in the future. Very good, Becky. Thank you. Joe? Hi, uh, thanks, Anthony. It's good to be here. Um, been with Healthcare Triangle now for about eight years, been in the healthcare IT industry for 20 plus years, um, started off working in hospitals and healthcare systems, been in the technology side all along, and um, really excited and looking forward to the conversation today. Very good, Ashley. Thanks, Anthony. Happy to be here as well. Ashley Rogers, I head up our healthcare group at Healthcare Triangle. Like Joe, I've been there for six years and prior to that got my start uh, working in the EMR space with Epic Systems and have been doing that for the last 15 or so years. So we see this issue all the time and looking forward to having an in-depth discussion about data and, and patient data sources. Thanks, Anthony. Very good. All right, Becky, we're going to start with you. Describe the different streams and sources of data that are brought together today at the point of care to deliver as complete a picture of the patient's history and current condition as possible. So I want to start by talking about current state. If you're doing as well as anybody can do, what's coming together today? So there's a lot of sources of information that come together, whether it's through exchange systems, um, EMRs, you know, patients bring their own information in. And of course, we're also continuing to experience that whole evolution of the internet of things where now my phone can tell me information, my watch can tell me information. Um, I was laughing the other day, my husband and I are doing some home renovations. And so we were looking at replacing our very good old standard toaster. And now, of course, there's toasters that can embed Alexa and you can set them and to do different things. So it's really um, an exciting time to be in healthcare because what we're experiencing is that 
patients uh, and consumers are just going to have healthcare in a variety of different ways. It's not going to be in the traditional four walls of the hospital. It's not necessarily always going to be in the home setting. There's going to be a lot of different uh, places that people will go to get their health care or have health care brought to them. And so there's lots of different sources of information. So historically, we, we tended to look at, you know, the bedside monitor, the vital sign machine, you know, what someone might have documented in a note or two. And now it's just really expanded much beyond that. And so what we have to do collectively as leaders in IT is figure out what is noise, what is directional information, and knowing that when you have multiple multiple sources of data, you are going to have disparities and, and um, probably similar pieces of information, but what can lead you in the right direction of making the right choice for your patient, right, making the right choice for those consumers, and then just making a difference in their outcomes and their quality of life. All right, very good. Stephanie? Well, I think Becky's answer is relatively comprehensive. Um, maybe just a couple of things that I would add. You know, I think we're getting better and better right now at bringing clinical decision support tools in. So it may not be something specific from the patient, but it's it's a it's an informational piece that can help in the making of decisions by bringing in advice and those kinds of things. Um, I think on the inpatient side, you know, we got really good at some of these pieces. Um, and now we're trying to figure out what those other contexts are. I think some of the other things that we're bringing in now to a limited extent, but will have work to do is um, things that are, you know, more aggregated on a larger scale. So dashboarded kind of information um, and things that have already been analyzed in some way. We're, we're doing some of that now, but I think there's a lot of opportunity to see where that can, can grow. Because to Becky's point, so many things are coming in now. Um, I think some of the key to the future is uh, aggregation, summarization, and anal you know, analysis prior to bringing it to the bedside or the clinic side or whatever. Very good. Ashley? I agree. I think Stephanie and Becky are incredibly comprehensive in the response in terms of what they're seeing in those data streams at the point of care. I think I would also add to that, we're starting to see more consumer-based data coming in at the point of care where we're seeing information related to where, how you can get a lift from, for a patient as they're headed home. You're starting to see service providers in terms of food or other services that that patient may need to pursue. And then even before that, starting to see the large providers like Google and Facebook bringing in comprehensive data about where patients, you know, what they're thinking about, what symptoms they're looking at. And so how we're starting to, to kind of broaden the picture of the patient beyond the hospital, even beyond home, but even to what they're Googling at this point as well. Very good, Joe. Yeah, I think, you know, there's not too much to add after the three of them, but um, they, they did a nice job. But I, I, I would say one of the things we're also seeing is a real interest in um, in the home data, whether it's a wearable data or smart devices. We probably aren't interested in the smart toaster, but we're definitely <laughs> interested in the smart scales and um, medication dispensing machines and things like that that are because the point of care in your question is really ch shifting a lot. And in the pandemic, you know, one of the silver linings is I think it's push the shift to change that point of care to include in the home or it, at your office or wherever you may be. So there's there's streams of data coming from there. I mean, most of us on this call are probably wearing a smartwatch and, you know, that has data that can be relevant to the care experience. So we're starting to see more interest in bringing that sort of wearable Internet of Things data to the table. Right. Joe, I think the toaster is still going to come back around. It's going to know how many <laughs> calories I consumed, exactly. and, you know, whether I ate it hot or cold, <laughs> you know, those kind of things. That's how I think that we're going to keep, keep gathering those data sources. So don't, don't throw the toaster out just yet. Well, yeah, and, 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 the toast is a lot of carbs. It's right? true. <laughs> But it also, you know, there, it is an indicator to some level of activity in the home. So if you're thinking about like seniors that were trying to keep in their homes and independent longer, you know, the use of those devices, whether it's making toast or, you know, opening the refrigerator or whatever, it's an indicator that they're up, they're moving around, they're getting food, they're doing their activities of daily living. So. Very good. All right. Uh, Stephanie, let's start with you. How do you think about hospital care versus home care? In the hospital, the workflow is well established. The nurses maintain almost constant monitoring in the doctor's round. How does it work with home care? Who does the monitoring? And what is the health system's role? Who's getting that piece of information? 
that the toast was left in too long. And uh, what are they doing about it? Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is a great question that really isn't fully answered yet. It's a question that we all need to be keeping in our minds as we figure out what is the way forward, what are the right data sources, um, and what do we do with that information? I think what we know in the hospital is that not only do we have defined roles, but we also have defined technologies and a long history of bringing these data sources in. Even when we were doing it on paper, we were tracking vital signs all the time. We were tracking telemetry monitoring. Maybe it was integrated, maybe it wasn't, but we were used to assimilating those data points. We had specific people who were responsible for aggregating and assimilating and reporting those pieces. And not to say that there's not more opportunity on the inpatient side, but that's been really well established. What isn't well established is on the home side. You know, for example, the toaster at some element, like as a physician, don't bring me the number of times the toaster has been used today. That's not what I need to know. Um, what I really need to know is how does that data relate to the overall well-being of the patient? What, what can we use to analyze the information? I think back to you know fetal monitoring. When we first started doing fetal monitoring and we were watching what babies were doing in utero for the very first time, we started to see like, whoa, their heart rate drops down really low. Well, how low is too low? How long can it stay that before it's demonstrating something bad? We weren't used to seeing that data all the time, so we didn't know what to make of it. If I start, you know, if, if I'm wearing a wearable at home with a constant telemetry on it, and it says I have, you know, a five beat run of AFib, is that clinically significant? We don't know yet because we've never been, we've never been capturing so much information. For all you know, you know, Maybe my blood sugar does spike to 397, but my A1C is still 5.2 because it does it once every, you know, whatever, after I eat, you know, cotton candy only. As we generate all of these pieces of data, particularly in the home environment, I think one of the big things we have to focus on is, first of all, creating a normalization so we know what to do with it because we, you know, we don't want, for example, C-section rates went up when we first started doing fetal monitoring outcomes didn't really change that much. Now we have a lot more information about what to do with those strips and when we really need a C-section versus when we don't. Similar to this, when do I really need to put somebody on a medication for AFib or what do I do about their blood pressure? Because we used to see these snapshots in time and now we've got this continuous monitoring um, available to us, but we don't really know what to do with that data. So I think, you know, again, as we're looking into the home and we have this ability to see things more comprehensively as well as continuously, we're going to have to do that work. Um, probably the other piece then that I would add about being in the home is there are some other unique opportunities, although we're going to have to really get our patients to understand and embrace them. And, and Joe was, you know, alluding to this, and even the toaster conversation a little bit, there are ambient monitoring devices, right? We can analyze voice. We can analyze movement without using video. Those are all things that could potentially improve the health and well-being of people in a home environment. Again, we'll have to figure out what those data points mean, because as a physician, I don't want to hear walked 500 steps, toaster went off twice, refrigerator opened three times, you know, whatever, like, wow, is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. But we're going to have to bring those pieces together. Really great, great points, Joe. Uh, just to, you know, add on to what Stephanie was saying, I think, you know, we, we've done some work with, an or with a company that is focused on helping keep seniors in their home longer with a monitoring system that it, both the company monitors the patient as well as it gives the family members, you know, comfort that they can see how their patient or how their family members are doing. And a lot of it is just what Stephanie said. There's a lot of noise in the data. And we've got to, we really have to work to find out um, what's the relevant information. And a lot of that is, um, you're right. I don't care if they walked 500 steps. I don't care if they toasted toast. What I do care about though, is if that's what they do every day. And all of a sudden today they didn't, that's relevant. So some of it is, and I think we find these norms that Stephanie's talking about both at an aggregate level for everybody, but we also start to find them at an individual level. So we now know that, you know, Joe Grinstead does this every day. And when Joe doesn't do that, that's something that's of interest potentially. 
Um, you know, so we start to see that and that's where the, you know, the AI and that sort of stuff starts to see patterns and recognize anomalies and then can help us, you know, understand where we need to be paying attention. Becky? Yeah, I think that, it, that Joe hit it right on the nail on the head there. It's right. It's trying to understand what's different, what's nor not normal for the patient, what's a, a deviation from what we had expect the patient to be doing. And I do think that this is where that consumer aspect, the consumer defining what is that normal for them is really going to be key so that we can't go in um, with the perspective of saying, well, we know how many times you should be walking and we know how many glasses of water you should be drinking a day because it's it can vary between patients. We don't know. We don't have large groups of data on some of that. So there's going to be have to be this normalization of data to figure out, well, what are the trends of you know, this age of a patient or these conditions of a patient, what should we expect? And then what is the are the expectations of the patient and the consumer in that whole process? So um, like I said, I think it, it's an interesting time to get all this information. I also think that we're gonna have to continue to see, you know, do patients want you in your home, <laughs> knowing all of their business and what you're doing? Um, you know, I always, uh, I'm sure many of you have devices that remind you like, hey, you need to get up and walk. And I'm sure you have all done the whole thing of rolling your eyes at that going, oh, well, thanks. No kidding. I got three more conference calls. You know, <laughs> I don't have time for that. So, so there's this annoyance factor, even though we may, so we have to figure out the balance of what does the consumer really want? What do we want to, how, how do we interject in that? And then the big driver of all of it is how is anyone going to get paid? Because uh, we need to understand if I have someone coming into my house and reminding me of healthy things to do or unhealthy things to avoid, who is paying for that? Um, and, and how do we make the, the most of that and bring the best value to either the entities that are managing populations and or to the consumer that's participating in that? That's so good. Uh, so many questions. Ashley? Yeah, I want to piggyback on what Becky had to say, and you kind of were headed in this direction. But I think one of the biggest challenges is going to be ultimately who owns that data? What data can we take in? And as you exactly said, Becky, how are health systems and hospitals going to get paid for this? You know, there's more and more of this accountable care and sort of these new models of payment that we have mixed success with. And a lot of it is the space between home and hospital and, and how we keep people out of the hospital. And all this data is valuable and it can provide a lot of insight in how we do so. But today the, the, the policies and the reality of our consumeristic society haven't sort of meshed, right? We, we can't really get at a lot of this and we are, it's a little unclear. And also, you know, Anthony, we work with about 100 hospital health systems, and we also work with five of the top 10 pharma companies. And this is a space as well where they really want to take in this data. They're trying to get at it as well to see, you know, how we adjust that entire spectrum of health for patients and how we adjust our drugs and everything associated with it all by the data that is in these patients' homes. So I think one of the big questions coming out of this will be not only what's the health system's role, but who owns it and whose data is it and who's allowed to use it in what forms at the end of the day. Very good, lots of good stuff. Um, next question, Becky, we're gonna start with you. Bringing together data is critical but it must be also be presented in the clinician's workflow on the device of their choosing in a visual way they can digest it. What are the, some challenges around doing that successfully? Well, I, I'm, you know, like many of you, we've all been in healthcare and IT aspects for, for a, a, a number of years collectively on this call. And um, I think one of the things that we've learned is it's over the years, it's really important as everyone's on their evolution or wherever they are on implementing systems or taking in data or trying to optimize things. It's really important to have clinicians that understand informatics involved in that whole process. I mean, that's why you have Stephanie who serves in a dual role of both as a CIO and having expertise in informatics, and then also brings to the table a clinical perspective. And that's just so valuable to be able to make the translation, to translate to clinicians, to translate to IT. And it's just really important to have when you are bringing systems together and, and being able to optimize things um, or when you're establishing new things. So for example, um, you know, I'm sure like many organizations are, are in the process of rolling out vaccination efforts 
vaccination strategies can be everything from vaccinating teammates to community members, um, you know, small scale events, large scale events. How do you take it to disparate groups? How do you reach people that can't come out of the home? And it's really important. What we found at Atrium Health is you really have to have a clinical informaticist in that process to make sure that whenever you're establishing a program, you're getting it right, right out of the gate. Because it's really hard to come back in later and optimize things. It's all work that we've done and it can be done, but it's really great to have that in, um, clinical informatics person or team to help drive those things whenever you're establishing programs and when you're bringing together data for the, the first time. So I, I think that's one of the key things that that uh, challenges that we've seen that hopefully many have learned from that and that will continue to change that into the future. The other thing would be to understand, um, and you know Ashley mentioned this, is really to understand that business driver of understanding because you know you can fix clinical workflow but if you don't have the financial and strategic understanding of how that fix fits into your overall comprehensive plan then you know it might be a great program but it might not fall flat and and not have the financial support to continue it so i think that's one of the things that we've really um learned is having the business financial and strategic acumen in all projects that you're doing and all initiatives really helps set you up to ensure the longevity of those, the success of, from those, and that, that you're creating a foundation that you can build upon. So bringing together data is just, it's going to continue to become more and more complex, but you've got to have those key components of clinical, financial, strategic, business acumen, all of that tied together to make things successful. Great points. Very good. Stephanie? Yeah, I think just a couple things I would add, you know, as I think about the challenges specifically, when you talk about presenting things in the clinician's workflow and you get to a little bit of the on the device of their choosing, let's be honest, we can't do all of that right now, right? If I say what I want you to present it to me on is my watch, there are some things I can't present to you on your watch. And if you want it on your watch and I want it on my iPhone and this person wants it on their Android tablet and this person wants it on the desktop, the reality is not everyone has the same device of choosing, not everyone has the same clinical workflow and we already all have limited resources. And so we have to be, I think, realistic, um, explicit and help set expectations around what really is possible today in, hey, we're thinking about bringing this data set to you into your workflow. Do you think it would be helpful if the first answer to that is yes, then it's like, okay, here's how we can present it today. Is that still helpful to you? And if the answer is, ooh, really? I got to log into a different system on a different device on what? No, not so much. When it can do this, then bring it to me. That's part of this work that Becky is talking about on, on having the bridge of the clinical understanding and the informatics because Sometimes what, even though technology has come so far, there are still limitations to what we can do and how we can bring it to people. And we need to be transparent about that. And we need to let the clinicians decide because the other thing on the other side of this that we haven't really touched on is as we bring more data elements together, there's a whole other part of what does that mean from a liability perspective? Yeah, right. What if I don't look at that data? What if I could have, should have, whatever, what if I interpret it, you know, and all of those pieces. And so we're really doing our clinicians a disservice if we don't have these conversations, set the expectations and allow them to help us decide that just because we can doesn't mean we should, at least maybe not right now if we can't do it in the right way because we're, we're, we're getting there and IoT and the connectedness of all kinds of things, we're rapidly making progression on this. But, um, you know, really, for right now, we're still very centered in an EMR centric world. Um, and that provides limitations too, right? I mean, there are some things we can interface and bring in and there are some things we can't. And I don't know that that will be our construct forever, but it is our current reality and we have to um, acknowledge that and work through that. Great, great points. Ashley? I agree with Becky and Stephanie, particularly on the point of we have to have not only the clinician's perspective on the data that should come in and how it should come in and where it should come in, but that financial piece as well. And there's just a constant onslaught. I mean, there's a constant onslaught for all of us when it comes to data in our day-to-day -day lives and every, you know, every aspect you can 
always be overwhelmed. And I think as we look at the clinician workflow, that has been something that's continued to rise, right? We deal with burnout all the time. It's becoming an even bigger topic as if, than it was before. And I think if you are not careful in the ways that Becky and Stephanie have described in, in the process and having informatics involved in discussing, okay, just because we can, should we? Um, you, you continue to exacerbate that situation, right? And you've got alert fatigue and data overload. And yes, we have all the data in the world, but we're not doing anything with it because we can't pay attention to everything. So putting the right piece of information at the right time in the right place is critical. And all those inputs are essential to get there. Very good, yes. We will talk a little bit more about alert fatigue. So I'm glad you brought it up. Joe? Um, I don't have a, a ton to add. I mean, um, I think everybody's on the right page there. Um, you know, the one thing I think we're starting to see is, they, you know, to, to Stephanie's point, there's a lot we cannot put on a smartwatch or a mobile phone and things like that. But there are some things that we can. And I think we do want to look for opportunities to intelligently take data out of the stream that is something we could present in those formats, you know, something that could be just a basic alert about something or a reminder about something um, to help the clinician remember that they needed to do certain things. Those are things we can start to incorporate there. But again, when we say clinicians workflow today, we still are just talking about mostly the EMR. You know, we're not talking about, you know, all these other disparate data sources. So are our EMRs even ready to start bringing in all of this data that we're talking about from these different sources? So. It's, it's, um, it's an interesting challenge and a lot of opportunity. All right, very good. Let's do a little bit more about alert fatigue. Um, I'm sure everybody's gonna worry about it, uh, but uh, any more thoughts, Stephanie? Yeah, I think one of the things that we can look at to help sort of combat alert fatigue is we've had a tendency to be really additive in our processes. Let's add one more thing. Let's bring in one more source. Let's give one more workflow. I think we're, technology is also giving us some opportunity to take some stuff away. You know, I, I think about um, where where things are going with um, creating documentation without having to create documentation, right? Taking the ambient experience of me having an interaction with a patient, a nurse having an interaction with a patient, taking the salient clinical elements out of that and putting it into a document so that I don't have to do that. If you take that intellectual energy out of my workflow, I actually could assimilate more pieces of information, you know, respond to more alerts. Obviously it needs to be, you know, right time, right place, right patient, all of those pieces, but we're getting pretty good at that. It's how many of them are there and how many other things are you asking me to think about at one time? So I think, you know, while we want to be really careful about the alerts themselves, I think we can provide more, and I, maybe it's almost more advice, right? I hate alert sort of feels like this alarm, <laughs> yucky, who wants to hear an alert, right? If I get an alert on my phone, it's always a negative. So if it's, you know, information and it's advice, maybe that's a more favorable way of looking at it. But if we're going to, if we're going to become very advice driven, clinical decision support driven, what can we take out of the workflow so that I have the mental energy to focus on that? That's a great point. Um, Becky, uh, I've spoken to physicians before about this kind of thing, and the word alert uh, to them means interruption in uh, their thought flow, their, their process, they were doing something, and they get interrupted all the time, right? You know that as a nurse. Um, so your thoughts about that and trying to prevent um, that happening? Yeah, I think, I think there's, there's been a lot of, um, you know, publications about clinician burnout, and we're really trying to make sure everyone understands everyone gets alerts. I mean, um, and unfortunately, we are all experiencing, I think, alert fatigue in our own personal life. So if any of you have children, if any of them have to go to the dentist or the orthodontist, there's repetitive texting and an email and a reminder and then my outlook tells me and i'm like okay we're gonna get to the orthodontist you know i mean and again they're driving their business so i understand it but under you know if you have multiple children and then you also add a sporting event and a, uh you know um an education you know some schooling stuff on it it's overwhelming in your day life uh, family life, and then also to have that at work, I think that's what's really contributing. It's not necessarily uh, one piece of your life that's, uh, you know, annoying you. It's really everything is coming at people. You know, 
um, many decades ago, I said, oh, you can't over communicate. And the reality is you absolutely can and drive people crazy so they don't see anything. So we've done a lot of optimization efforts, you know, like many organization, uh, you know, a million clicks removed, but, you know, 13 million alerts turned off, those kinds of things. And I think that what we really um, are in need of is some re regulatory support in this, because if we can turn off some of the regulatory regulation um, noise, I, I, I call it, then we can really get to the, the reality and focus on things. I'll, I'll get, and, and part of the regulations are challenged because instead of designing regulations for the common denominator, the regulations are somewhat designed for the least common denominator, which really puts all those that do have made efforts from a technology perspective they, they, they unfortunately get burned by that. So an example that I'll give you is, you know, every single day we assess patients and, and many organizations across the United States do this, assess patients for skin breakdown, assess them for falls risk. Well, we have technology that should be able to tell us these things. So if, uh, if I'm a 90 year old patient that comes to the hospital, I, I should probably just be able to assume that if you're 90, you, your, your skin has had 90 years of use. You're probably at risk for skin breakdown and you're probably at risk for a fall. I shouldn't have to do an assessment on you because that should be an automatic given. You know? And so what we should be able to do is say, these patients automatically qualify for these precautions. We're not going to do this documentation on a daily basis because it's ridiculous. And, and, that, and we need to have the regulatory support on that to say, yeah, you're right, you don't have to do that. Now there might be, um, and that's why we do need a technology and algorithms behind the scenes to help us identify the 30 year old that normally wouldn't qualify for those things, but we need to go in and assess it um, and figure out different things. Um, and that's, I think the challenge that some of us are living in, in tons of alerts, tons of fatigue in personal life, as well as professional life. And then we need professional uh, regulatory partnerships to help us alleviate some, uh, some of this so we can get rid of not only the burden of documentation, the burden of alerting, the burden of reminders so that people can focus on being good clinicians and getting to the business of getting and bringing better care to the patients is what we really want them to focus on. Great points. Very good. Joe? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things Becky's touching on and, and Stephanie touched on it a little bit ago is I think generally we've applied alerts to everybody. You know, we come up with an alert for, you know, skin breakdown or falls and we apply that to everybody. And I think what AI and ML are going to start to offer us is the ability to individualize what we notify or alert on to that patient. You know, each patient's circumstances are different. And the more we learn about patients, the more we know what their normal respiratory rate is. We would learn what their normal blood pressure is. We learn what their normal A1C values are. And the more we can do that, the more we can say, well, yeah, for, for Joe, this might be something that's an anomaly, but for Anthony, it's not because that's just Anthony. So I think we can individualize that a lot more and turn down a lot of the noise that way. Um, you know, Becky talked about the, the pervasive reminders we get from doctor's offices and things, you know, could we not learn a little better that, you know, Hey, Joe's a flake. He missed, he's missed the appointment six times in the last five years. Yeah, we're going to send him a lot of reminders, but Becky, she's on it. She never misses anything. We're going to dial down the reminders for her because it's not important to her anymore. Well, I think it, maybe it's something, uh, no offense to any dentist, but uh, yeah, my kids have a dentist appointment today and we must have gotten five reminders. Uh, so maybe Be there on time. You better, better be there on time. I, I'm telling you. <laughs> Ashley, Ashley, what are your thoughts? You know, Anthony, I think it's been fairly comprehensive. I'll just echo, um, I think we continue to be challenged with the burnout factor, and this will continue to get exacerbated. There's not a clear, easy path. AIML is great, but we're still not there in terms of how we do this and how we achieve it effectively with our technology systems. And Becky's point is incredibly valid. The regulations and the requirements are just not keeping up um, with the capability of the technology. And so, the government and the payer says you have to do it a certain way. The technology could enable us to do it a different way, but we can't make that move until the regulation catches up. Very good. All right, Joe, we're going to start with you on this one. What are some future streams of data you anticipate being able to integrate to maintain a complete picture 
of the patient. So what do you see as anything we didn't touch on already as sort of uh, things people should start to anticipate and think about? I think, um, you know, we've covered a lot of the stuff with the wearables and the Internet of Things and those sorts of devices. And I think we're going to continue to see that, you know, become a bit a better, bigger part of developing a picture of the patient. I think we're starting to see data sources out there. Um, I was at an Amazon Web Services conference a couple of years ago, and they rolled out a, a service called Amazon Data Marketplace, where they have all these different data sets about um, you know, whether it's geographic data sets or economic data sets and things like that, I think we can start to pull some of that data in as well. That is going to give us a big, a better picture of the patient as a whole. Like if I took this patient's address, how many grocery stores are within an X mile radius of that patient where they can get fresh produce or do they live in a food desert? I think that helps a caregiver start to have a, a bigger picture of this patient and the things that are going to impact their care and, you know, their conditions. Very good, Becky. You know, I absolutely agree. I think that geo mapping and understanding what are the influences in the community that are going to impact the consumers and the patient really is going to have a, a big um, impact. Also, knowing what are their shop, shopping habits, what are they purchasing, what are they not purchasing. But again, that's where privacy is going to come into play of what you have access to and what you don't. Can I see your credit card expenditures so I can see exactly where you're spending your money? Um, you know, how does that tie into your personal habits? And then of course, being able to come into their home and gather data there. So I do think those are important sources of information. That's where the regulations are really going to weigh in as to what how, how do we help paint the picture? What's the value of painting that picture? Um, and, and who is that valuable to? Is it to the healthcare organization? It, is it to government entities? Is it insurance companies? Um, or is it to the individuals? So all makes for exciting times <laughs> and <laughs> ability to have a role in influencing that. Um, so I think it's going to be uh, some interesting dynamics. I think also in the experience of COVID that we've all had, there have been some things that have developed really, really rapidly in this whole pandemic. Hopefully that fast pace of things is going to continue to arise. I also think that patients are going to expect anything that we established in, during the pandemic, such virtual visits. You know, I don't want to go see my doctor anymore in person. That's annoying. Why? I have to sit there for an hour and a half, you know, I have to wait 30 minutes for them to show up. You know, if people have that, have gotten rid of that experience, they're not going to want to go back to that experience. So we've got to figure out um, how to continue, continually evolve and put the consumer as the driver of what these experiences are going to be like in the future. When we do have these data sources, how does that change healthcare overall and our delivery of such? Very good. Ashley? Yeah, I agree with Becky on the consumerist side. Certainly, you know, we're starting to see even Twitter opening up APIs so you can run sentiment analysis, so you can determine where people are, what they're talking about, what they're struggling with. Google did this with COVID in terms of symptom searches, and they do it with the flu in terms of predictions. How do we take in that data? How do we understand it? And does Google really have, or Facebook have a better sense of what the general population is dealing with than the health system does? Because they have access to that data and the health system doesn't today. And really, there's not a, a method by which to gain that access, that question of the data um, ownership continues to arise. I would also say, Anthony, future streams of data are very exciting, but there's so many streams of existing data we still can't take in and we can't make actionable or real. I mean, the New York Times is reporting that the fax machine is the primary data communication factor with COVID. We can't do anything with that. We're not taking, we're, we're moving paper around in a digitized format without actionable information coming out of it. So there's so much focus in healthcare about solving the existing problem as well that we have to think about before we can even move into this future state conversation, I think. So lots of pulls on the health systems as they try to manage what still isn't solved while being demanded to take on internet of things, Google information, Facebook information, how do they prioritize and how do they, they fix all the issues at one time? Stephanie, how are you gonna fix all the issues at one time? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, I'm not, and I think that that <laughs> is part of, you know, part of the challenge here is 
again, it comes back to just because we can doesn't mean we should. Um, and so we really need to analyze what these things are and figure out what the value is that they're going to provide and how, what do we understand about them that is going to really have them add value. I think we've seen a lot of things that we've done in healthcare where we set these parameters of like, you know, if, if, this, if, if we monitor these three things and we do these three interactions or these three um, treatments or whatever it is, we'll see an improvement in where patients, you know, go. And a lot of those things have not come to fruition. We set parameters around what we think is going to make a person healthier or more well. And what we've ended up doing is monitoring a bunch of stuff, spending a bunch of money on stuff. And we don't see people living longer. We don't see people you know, getting the quality of life that they want out of things. So I think we really, as we start to look at these data elements that we can bring in, need to be focused on <clears throat> what are they delivering and adding new to this uh, equation. Um, one that we have only touched on a little bit that I think is going to become a really increasingly significant element um, is, is voice. Right. I mean, there's just so much that we over time are learning about a person's voice. We the, COVID is another example. You can, there are some apps now where you can talk into it and it will sort of make an assessment of how likely they think it is that you would have COVID. I, as a physician, there's no number of people, patients that can talk to me that I will ever be able to train my ear to say, oh, that's some COVID right there. <laughs> I mean, I might be able to say that person has a respiratory illness, but I'm certainly not gonna be able to differentiate COVID from whatever. Some of that stuff is still in its infancy, but I think voice is gonna be really powerful. We've got, you know, there's now opportunities to evaluate for depression and things like that based on voice. Um, so I think that's gonna be great. A little side um, maybe detour from this that I wanna make is putting out there for people to think about is, we also really risk in all of this and bringing in these data sets, creating further disparity in our patient populations for the people who I can't get this data from. If you don't have, if you have a dirt floor and no electricity, it's unlikely I'm gonna put a device in your house that is going to transmit something to me. Even if I just look at my own geography, you can have electricity and all the whatever, but if you live between two slabs of granite, I can't get that data to me. And so, you know, I think we're also going to have to be really careful as we look at normalizing these pieces and creating it as an expectation about how to manage patients that we may be further selecting out some of our patients that are now going to be even further left behind because we aren't capturing this data and yet we've changed our model to um, incorporate it. Great points. All right. I want to <clears throat> ask an audience, pose an audience question. Uh, Becky, let's, let's go with you on this one. In terms of data flow, HIEs have had mixed success. How do you see this fitting into the data integration and flow to the physician practice? Yeah, good intentions. You know, I, I mean, I, I think, unfortunately, they just need a lot of TLC and making it easier and prettier and just in, embedded within the workflow. That is the biggest challenge of HIEs. Like they'll have great information, but there's also just a bunch of noise. So if someone, for example, has blurred vision, you know, that might be coded 12 different ways in an outpatient setting based upon the provider. And then bringing all of that noise into when the patient now becomes, comes in with a cardiac issue, I don't know if that matters or doesn't matter. And so sometimes the HIEs are great because you get access to information, but then if it ends up requiring, uh, you know, capacity, mental capacity to read through that information and not be able to take action on it, that's where the challenge is. So we've got to figure out ways that that whole process becomes simpler um, that there's a normalization of data across that so that I, I really don't care that you have, you know, a slight blurred vision or, it, you know, it's coded 12 different ways. I just need to know you have a problem with your eyesight and your left eye, and that's all we need to know. Um, and then I even need to understand, is that even relevant to what I'm doing right now and caring for the patient? So the HIEs, again, are great sources of information. Normalizing the data, leveraging the data is what's going to be key um, 
to making you know the data valuable to the patient as well as to the the clinicians who are caring for that patient. Ashley, anything on the HIE question? Yeah, I agree with great idea has not worked out, which I think is sort of the theme in general of interoperability in the healthcare space. We've tried a dozen times. We have a handful of regulations trying to push it. You know, fire is great. It's actually a really big change for us and it's exciting, but we're still not moving that lever. And arguably that's not necessarily a technology challenge. That's a politics, you know, in working together, a, a vendor challenge between competing EMR vendors who don't necessarily want to share that data. And the policy is finally catching up, but we still just have so much further to go. And until the barriers come down or there's mutual benefit to that data sharing across all these systems, I just don't think we're going to meet the challenge effectively. No amount of ch technology is going to solve that problem. Stephanie? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, we participate in our state HIE. I, I think the concept is great. It is particularly, I, I look at it from my perspective as right now, we are a data contributor, right? We produce a huge amount of data. And for a small mom and pop pharmacy or primary care office not associated with a healthcare system in a town with 700 people, you know, it's, it's better than nothing for sure. Um, otherwise, they may or may not, you know, again, again with, with um, EHR vendor interoperability, if you've got Epic and somebody you want to talk to somebody else who has Epic, great, we can have, you know, a lot of data sharing. If you have Epic and, and maybe one of the other big partners, we can still have quite a bit of data sharing. But it, for some of our folks, you know, that are still in um, really small rural areas where that's not a, really a, a realistic option for them, it does at least give them some opportunity. Um, you know, the, the standardization of the data and, and cleaning up the noise is absolutely important. The workflow, it is a little bit challenging. I don't really ask any of our physicians to, to use the HIE because if it's not coming in through, you know, care everywhere or whatever, I'm not going to ask them to log in to a separate system in order to do that. Now, in a small practice, if that's my only option, um, I, again, I still think it's it's providing value right now. Um, it just has room for improvement. But I think really it's it's a solution that it that should be looked at as temporary, right? We'll know we've really arrived, to be perfectly honest, with interoperability and sharing of information when we don't need HIEs anymore, at least not in the way that we're saying that we are using them right now. When a health information exchange, like at a state level, is more about chronic disease management and knowing that patients, you know, cross over multiple areas and maybe live in one part of the state or one area at one time and another, and how do we bring pieces together and kind of have a, a central tool set for that. So I think, you know, conceptually that can be reimagined, but what the original concept was, was to take data from one place and get it to data and to get it to a source at another place because the two systems can't talk. I mean, it's a band-aid fix at best. Um, that is, is serving a purpose, but I think we have, uh, that's, it's not a goal. It's more of a transition. Excellent. Very good. Joe? Um, yeah, I think, you know, one of the things in the HIEs that we've worked with, I've seen is, you know, they, they, many of them have done a great job of accumulating a lot of data. And, you know, so, but they're, so they're a great data lake, maybe a data swamp in some cases. <laughs> um, but there, we still don't see a lot of work to interpret that data and, and make meaningful information come out of that data. And, you know, to Becky's point, there's just some stuff in there that I don't care about in my care setting. If I'm a cardiologist, I probably don't care about, you know, other factors of your care outside of your cardiovascular system. But I, there's opportunity with our emerging capabilities with, you know, machine learning and AI and things to get better at that and start to get more meaningful information out of this data. There's certainly a huge opportunity in the population health space with these HIEs to take a look at populations in a very large scale and understand what's really happening in the whole state of South Dakota with, with the, the people that live there. All right, well, we're getting short on time. What I wanna do is a, uh, a, a last round, get um, your best piece of advice to folks who are gonna listen to this event, who are listening to it now, who work in IT at the hospitals and health systems. They're struggling, they're having some trouble, they're doing the best they can, they're bringing some stuff together, they're having trouble with some other stuff. 
what's your best piece of advice to make them feel a little better or give them something to think about? Becky? You know, I think the pandemic has really changed my perspective, like to the advice of don't sweat the small stuff, make sure you're just moving forward in the right direction. That's all that matters. Don't waste your time and energy on emotion and just say, look, are we making the right decision and move forward? That's it. And, and really keeping things as simple as that and know that you're doing good work and then you keep, you just keep moving forward. Um, you might not, so, you might find a challenge that you can't solve today. Focus on the ones that you can solve and then you'll have a better day at the end of it. That's great. I love that. Stephanie. So that is great advice. I'll maybe slightly different direction around, um, you know, kind of coming a little bit back on, can we, should we, whatever talk, talk to your clinical end users, right? Start with what they need and what they want. Cause we all have more on our plates and more being asked of us from all different areas than we can get done right now. What are some things that really, you know, for them are going to make a difference and are doable? Um, I think it's okay to tell a, a leadership team, we're not mature enough to start doing, you know, voice biometric analysis and whatever. We, we're barely able to bring in our vital signs monitoring. <laughs> right? I think maybe we should do that part first. <laughs> so take, take the expertise that you have, know what's solvable and what's not be willing to, you know, it, it doesn't make you the no person by saying, gosh, we should walk before we run. Here's a way that we can do that. And then if you're in touch with your clinical end users and they feel that you're trying to solve their problems, there's going to be a lot of grace that's given around how long it takes to do that. They know that the problems we're trying to solve aren't easy. Um, we just need to communicate and work together. Love it. Love it. Joe. Well, first off, Anthony, I just want to put a shout out to um, the healthcare IT workers. A lot of people are recognizing the healthcare heroes that are on the front lines delivering the care. But I, I know for a fact, because I did it for a while, and I certainly talked to plenty of these folks, those folks are in the IT department are doing heroic work. I've talked to at least one person that said, hey, I'm going to have to reschedule that meeting tomorrow because I got to figure out how to run the network to the tent that we just set up in the parking lot, you know? So just a big shout out to those folks. They, they are doing um, heroic work to support the people that are doing heroic work on the very front line. Um, I, I would say, you know, one of the things we struggled with in healthcare historically is looking at new capabilities, new technologies, new opportunities there. Um, and, and to some extent, the pandemic pushed us to move faster there, whether it's, you know, pushing telemedicine out faster or exchanging data better and things like that. Um, be be open-minded about, you know, what is possible. There's lots of tools and technologies out there that aren't classically part of the healthcare toolbox that maybe we need to start making them part of the healthcare toolbox. Very good, Ashley. I'm going to give you the last word. Exciting, Anthony. Um, <laughs> I agree with everyone here today. I think I'm incredibly impressed with how healthcare has responded to the pandemic. You know, what used to take months is being done in days. And that's a testament to the capability of leaders like Stephanie and Becky and many others in this space. Um, and I hope it can to continue to see that grow and just expand. I think it's taught us a lot in healthcare that we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be super concerned about, can I take this on? How, you know, have I considered every risk possible here? Because we work in care and in patient care, that's naturally our question. But now we know we can meet those challenges more quickly and more effectively. Let's continue to do so and kind of step back and say, no, it's okay to continue. It's okay to move forward. It's okay not to sit and to constantly question and, and assess risk here, but we can do this and we can do it quickly and we can do it successfully. And the pandemic and has really proved that in healthcare and they've met the challenge really, really well. Excellent. Well, that's about all we had time for today. Tremendous uh, program, really good stuff today. Regar uh, continuing education, you could use the final slide in this deck. You'll get an email when the on-demand recording is ready to view. If you want to sponsor an event with us, you can reach out to Nancy from our team and you can go to our website to register for upcoming events. With that, I wanna thank our tremendous panel, Becky Fox, Dr. Stephanie Lar, Joe Grinstead and Ashley Rogers. And I wanna thank Healthcare Triangle for sponsoring and making this discussion possible. And I wanna thank you, our attendees. And with that, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.